Hi, I'm Joe Yoni. Welcome to Caribbean Weather Dude channel, and this is World War Weather. In my recent video about how bad weather ended the Battle of the Somme, I made a startling revelation, not just to you, but to myself, that the Germans didn't have great weather reporting. This became very crucial in both World War I and World War II. Today we're going to talk about the German war for weather reporting. Let's go. This is bad news. My God. Falling out right now. Anything could happen. Wow. I'll watch the video later. Feel the heat. I need more knives. I need water. I ain't dry mopping this. Kuba Khan's attempt to conquest Japan was foiled when his invasion fleet was destroyed by a typhoon. Napoleon's Grand Army perished during his ill-fated Russian campaign, laid low by the sweltering heat of summer and the frigid cold of winter. Even at Waterloo, torrential rains turned the battlefield into a quagmire and contributed to the final defeat. But the weather became even more important during the 20th century thanks to the invention of the airplane, the tank, the modern ship. Bombers and other aircraft might be grounded by bad weather or their targets obscured by fog or cloud. Land offensives also depended on accurate predictions of the weather, and at seas, convoys bearing vital supplies needed reliable forecasts to deliver their cargo. Meteorologists of the 1940s lacked modern devices such as satellite imagery, depending on barometers and other traditional time-honored tools primarily. Even so, weathermen back then could make fairly accurate predictions up to 72 hours in advance or so. When the war began in 1939, the Germans found themselves at a disadvantage when it came to gathering and interpreting weather data. European weather forms in the Arctic regions of the Northern Hemisphere, finally drifting west to east. Germany had no reporting stations up in those regions that it could use, therefore it was at a disadvantage. Greenland, Jan Mayen Island, and Svelbard Archipelago were examples of prime weather reporting locations, but they were owned by then neutral Denmark and Norway. In the early months of the war, Scandinavia's neutrality actually helped the Germans. In Greenland, for example, the island's weather stations regularly transmitted information in plain international code. The meteorologists on Norway's Jan Mayen Island did the same thing. Anybody could see it. But all that changed when Hitler invaded Denmark and Norway on April 9, 1940. When their home countries were occupied, the island colonies were forced to fend for themselves. Most chose resistance, maybe even passively, as a better option than collaboration with the Nazis. The German conquest of the homelands meant the Danes and Norwegians overseas began to cooperate with the British and Americans. By the summer of 1940, the Germans found themselves on the horns of a dilemma. They had triumphed in Scandinavia, but that varied success jeopardized future operations. Appalled at the brutal subjugation of their countries, Danish and Norwegian weathermen overseas now gave their information to the Allies. Casting about for a solution to an ever-growing problem, the Germans turned to Admiral Karl Donitz and his submarines. Two German U-boats were assigned full-time duties as weather reporting stations from August 1940 to January 1941. Donitz himself chafed at these tasks, believing that gathering meteorological data, however crucial, was secondary to sinking enemy ships. You could see his point. The commitment seemed small on paper, but due to turnovers, transit, and refits, six submarines were actually part of the program. Dernitz began the war with 57 submarines, and only 27 of those were ocean-going long-range Type 7s. Originally, plans for 300 U-boats to prowl the Atlantic were the case, but the war came too soon for these projections to become a reality. The Admiral hated the idea of his precious U-boats being used in such a pedestrian manner. German U-boats finally ended their commitment full-time in January 1941, much to Dernitz's relief. However, they still occasionally gathered weather data while on other missions. As time went on, U-boats also ferried weather personnel to and from weather station sites, transported equipments, and carried base supplies. The Luftwaffe also conducted weather reconnaissance patrols that ranged as far as Greenland. Weather Kongungstaffel Weather Squadron 5, operating out of Trondheim and Banach, Norway, made regular twice-daily flights across the frigid Arctic seas. The squadron used specially configured Heinkel HE-111s, Junkers JU-88s and JU-52s, and Dornier DO-117s, all sporting the squadron's distinctive frying frog emblem as nose art. Weather Station 5 had to deal with Arctic conditions, including temperature extremes, icing and engine problems. Allied anti-aircraft defenses at Spitsbergen and elsewhere took a toll, as did Allied fighters. But in the end, weather gathering by air was too unreliable. Ironically, missions were often cancelled because aircraft were grounded due to 
bad weather. What are Kungdung Staffein, also known as Wakusta or Westa, were flying units of the Luftwaffe used for weather reconnaissance? Many meteorologists were conscripted into the squadrons to collect weather data, and up to 200 of them were killed. The Germans decided to send weather ships. These were fishing trawlers. They were able to escape Allied detection, presumably, while at the same time supplying vital meteorological data in the North Atlantic waters. The weather trawler program was not merely a failure, but an unmitigated disaster, in case a fact can be made that it was one of the major contributions to Germany's defeat. Unfortunately for the Nazis, the British were monitoring weather ship transmissions to such an extent the element of surprise was lost. One by one, the weather trawlers were captured or sunk, relentlessly pursued by the British Royal Navy. The Royal Navy expended much time, effort, and materiel taking these weather ships, not just because they were transmitting weather meteorological data. The weather trawlers carried Enigma cipher machines, devices that transmitted and received messages in the secret German Enigma code. Each captured weather trawler provided cryptographic items, rotors, and the like that helped British crack the Enigma code. The Germans never fully understood that their weather missions compromised Enigma, but they did come to realize the trawlers were too vulnerable to enemy action. It became more and more clear that only land-based stations could provide accurate weather data needed to form useful predictions. On the Debit side, all possible sites were in Allied or in anti-Nazi hands in 1940, making the German task that much more difficult. But these possible weather station sites also were very remote, desolate areas, infamous for their cold temperature extremes and natural hazards. Humans had to deal with such dangers as polar bear attacks. In such isolated areas, it might be possible to establish bases that would escape detection. Pouring over a map, it was clear Jan Mayen Island, Spitsbergen, and Greenland were among the best locations for gathering and sending weather data. All were in Arctic regions where European weather fronts form, and all were remote enough to give the Germans at least a hope of success. In addition, weather stations were already in place. If the German Navy, Kriegsmarine, acted swiftly, it might establish bases before the British could effect countermeasures. Jan Mayen Island is a barren rock only 34 miles long. Its a notable, most notable feature is the snow-covered 7,470-foot volcano Berenberg. Owned by Norway, it has no significant natural resources, but it's ideal for weather reporting. In 1940, Jan Mayen was inhabited by four Norwegian meteorologists who faithfully transmitted weather data to the homeland. They were shocked and appalled by the German invasion, which they heard over their radio. The meteorologists immediately ceased transmitting to Norway and began sending reports to the British instead. They requested the British help because it was feared the Germans might attempt a physical occupation of their island. British authorities acted, dispatching f the free Norwegian gunboat Fritjof Nansen with a crew of 68 men to help the meteorologists and garrison the island against the Germans. The Fritjof Nansen arrived in October 1940, but it ran aground on one of Jan Mayen's underwater reefs. The ship was a total loss, temporarily mar marooning the Norwegians with the weather station personnel they had come to support. Winter was coming on with its storms and near total darkness. In light of these changing circumstances, it was de decided to temporarily abandon Jan Mayen to the elements. The now stranded garrison radioed British authorities and settled down to await rescue. The food situation was a problem, but polar bears prowled the area in their constant search for seals. Two or three of the giant animals were shot and added to the larder. By the time the rescue ship appeared, the seas were rough with white foamed waters crashing against the island rocks. It took 10 trips to shuttle the stranded Norwegians to the rescue ship. The four original meteorologists were the last to abandon the island. But before they departed, they destroyed their radio equipment and anything else that might be of value to the Germans. The British fully intended to reoccupy Jan Mayen in the spring. The Germans soon noticed the island had gone silent. There was no radio traffic coming from Jan Mayen. They dispatched reconnaissance aircraft from Norway, which confirmed the island was uninhabited. The Abwehr took an immediate interest in the situation. Conventional wisdom held that no one in his right mind would mount an expedition to Jan Mayen so close to the coming of winter, but if the Germans acted with dispatch, they might land a team before the really bad weather and darkness set in. It was a risk, but a calculated one, and would reap rich rewards in weather data. A weather troop was immediately formed called Sonderkommando Graf Finkenstein, named after its aristocratic leader Ulrich Graf Count von Finkenstein. The expedition was an inter-service one and slightly confusing in composition, overlapping with authority and duties, which was typical of Nazis in this period. The team would be transported by the fishing trawler Heinrich Friesch, captained by Lieutenant Wilhelm Krach 
and crewed by 13 civilian sailors. The Henrik Fries departed Trondheim, Norway on November 12, 1940. Apart from the crew, there were three distinct units aboard. First, there was a Luftwaffe weather troop, three men under Lieutenant Harald Brun. Next, there was two Abwehr Funker Intelligence Service radio men who transmitted weather reports back to Europe. Finally, there was the Sonderkommando Graf Finkenstein, a party consisting of the Count, the Turncoat, Dane, Kurt, Callus Hansen, and three other men. Unfortunately for the Germans, the British were taking no chances with the Mine, which they codenamed Island X. The Royal Navy determined that it must be kept out of German hands at all costs, kept a close eye out on the island and all of its approaches. With stormy seas and the fast approach of winter, the patrols were tedious and dangerous, but the British perseverance was rewarded. The Heinrich Fries arrived at Jan Mine on November 16, 1940 without incident, but it luck would not hold out. The light cruiser HMS Nyad caught the German trawler before it could land its weather team and its equipment. Heinrich Fries tried to run, and Nyad gave chase. Now, there are two versions of what happened. One says the German skipper tried to maneuver his ship through the treacherous rocks but failed in his attempts. Most accounts maintain the Germans deliberately wrecked the ship to avoid its imminent capture. In any case, Heinrich Fries smashed into the lava rocks, the impact shuddering the vessel from stern to stern. Lifeboats were launched with great difficulty. The heavy surf kept pushing them back against the sides of the sinking German trawler. Huge waves engulfed the lifeboats, swamping them and forcing the survivors into the frigid sea. Two men drowned, but the rest, soggy, exhausted and freezing, made it ashore, but were picked up by a British landing party. The Allies returned to Jan Mine on March 10, 1941, when the free Norwegian ship Villascari arrived with 12 Norwegian meteorologists. As time went on, a small garrison was added to the island's population, together with some anti-aircraft guns. The latter were needed because Germans began conducting air raids on the weather station. Jan Mylan Island is about 600 miles west of Norway, which is in reach of long-range German bombers. Four-engine Fokke Wolf FW-200 Condor bombers visited frequently for a time but inflicted little significant damage. This was no milk one for the Luftwaffe air crews because the weather could turn bad. On August 7, 1941, a Fokke Wolf 200 crashed on one of the island's mountainsides, lost in heavy fog. All nine crew members were killed and pieces of wreckage remain to this day. In 1950, the wreckage of another German plane was found on the southwest side of the island. By the end of 1941, the Germans had given up any idea of taking the island, though nuisance bombing rains did continue sporadically. Spitsbergen was another area of interest for the Germans in their never-ending quest to establish weather stations. It's a large island, some 280 miles long and from 25 to 140 miles wide. Spitsbergen is part of the Svalbard archipelago and is owned by Norway. It assumed an even greater importance after Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941. Apart from its strategic location for weather gathering, Spitsbergen had valuable coal deposits. Some of the island's coal mines were operated by Norwegian concerns, while others were controlled by the Russians. Preliminary investigations ruled out Spitsbergen as an Allied naval base due to the hazards of seasonal ice. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was behind a plan that called for bold and decisive actions. The entire population of the island would be evacuated, with the Russians repatriated to, the, repatriated to the Soviet Union, and the Norwegians would go to Britain. Both Moscow and the Norwegian government in exile readily agreed to the scheme. The mission, codenamed Operation Gauntlet, sailed on August 19, 1941 and arrived a few days later. The British effort included Canadian troops and the Royal Navy's Force K under Rear Admiral Philip Vian. The troops were carried by the liner Empress of Canada, escorted by Vian's flagship, the HMS Nigeria, the cruiser Aurora, three destroyers, and several smaller support ships. At the time, it was not known whether the Germans had occupied the island. They hadn't, and the local Norwegian and Russian inhabitants were more than cooperative. The miners were evacuated and demolition teams fanned out to destroy mines and excess fuel stocks. While the demolition continued, radio stations on the island continued to broadcast as if all was well, even sending false weather reports of heavy fog to deter German reconnaissance aircraft. Only when the mission was completed were the radio stations destroyed. No fewer than 1,955 Russians and 765 Norwegians were evacuated from Spitsbergen. The operation was a success, but once again with Jan Mylan Island, the Germans attempted to exploit the vacuum that was created by the Allied withdrawal. It took them a few days to catch on, but once they realized what was happening, they moved swiftly. A 10-man Luftwaffe meteorological team was landed on the northeast corner of the island, and a landing strip was carved out on the barren soil. 
Throughout 1941, the Luftwaffe shuttled in nearly four tons of supplies. By November 11, several German weather stations were now in full operation. Station Banso passed the winter of 1941-1942 in Adventalen near Longyear Bayern and Station Nosp transmitted near Crossfjord. The Allies were not going to let the Nazis seize control of the island without a fight. However, it was frustrating, but they did have to wait until the harsh Arctic winter had passed. For the next six months, the German weather stations were left unmolested. In May 1942, the ships Isbjorn and Selis arrived at Spitsbergen, carrying around 80 free Norwegian ski troops to root out the Germans and establish Allied control. The ships sailed up the Grand Fjord, Green Fjord successfully and anchored to unload the supplies. On the night of May 14th, they were attacked by FW-200s and badly damaged. One of the ships sank and the other was set ablaze. 14 Norwegians were killed in the air raid but the others successfully abandoned the ship and managed to reach ashore after plunging into sub-freezing water and clambering onto ice floes. According to a contemporary Time magazine account, they got to shore at Barentsburg, but the expedition was a shambles. The radio was gone. They were encumbered by wounded and only managed to salvage 15 skis, a few rifles, and a single broken lamp. Luckily, they managed to flag down a consolidated PBY Catalina flying boat from the British Coastal Command by using their salvage lamp. Their message was received and on June 2nd, the British arrived with reinforcements and supplies. The Norwegian ski troops now scoured the island for the elusive German stations and according to one report, there was a skirmish with one German killed. For the most part, however, the German weather stations simply shut down and melted away. The weather teams were evacuated by submarine. Although Germans were gone from Spitsbergen, they left an automated weather station behind that transmitted meteorological data through the summer of 1942. By this time, free Norwegian troops were in complete control of Spitsbergen. Allied island defenses included machine guns and 3-inch artillery. The Germans stubbornly refused to throw in the towel, and by the time of late 1942 and early 1943, the tide of war was turning against them. In October 1942, the Kriegsmarine landed a six-man team at the north of Crossfjord, which they dubbed Station Nossbaum. The Norwegians were never able to locate this Will-o'-the-Wisp station. In the late summer of 1943, Adolf Hitler decided to mount a major raid against Spitsbergen. Militarily, the operation made little sense. North Africa was lost. The German submarine offensive at Kursk was a failure. Frustrated by these events, Hitler perhaps sought solace in a cheap and easy victory. In any case, the raid at Spitsbergen, codenamed Zitronella, was overkill from the beginning. The operation included some of the most powerful service vessels of the German fleet, the battleship Tirpitz, the cruiser Scharnhorst, and nine destroyers. A battalion of German soldiers served as a landing party. The free Norwegian garrison of a hundred or so men could hardly be expected to stand up against this armada. The German fleet arrived at Spitsbergen on September 6, 1943, taking the Norwegians by surprise. Tirpitz leveled its 15-inch guns at Longyearbyen and Barentsburg, setting fire to the towns and killing some of the garrison. Scharnhorst and the other German ships added their firepower to the barrage. The Norwegian 3-inch guns were quickly suppressed, allowing the German troops to come ashore. Nine Norwegian soldiers were killed and 41 taken prisoner. Many of the garrison, however, escaped into the interior and were never captured. The Zitronella operation was the first and last time the Turpurts fired its guns in anger. The German fire coordination had been poor and at one point the mighty Tirpitz actually lobbed a 15-inch shell at its own men. Once the Germans secured the island, they set about destroying all Allied facilities, including the all-important weather station. For all its might, the German fleet was forced to withdraw after a few days. Their position was simply too exposed and untenable. After the Germans withdrew, the Allies rebuilt all facilities and reoccupied the island. The Nazis would never again come in such force, but the cat and mouse landing and withdrawing of weather station teams would continue. Greenland is the largest island in the world. It's 827,000 square miles. 80% of the land is buried in thick glaciers and only the southwestern corner is relatively congenial to civilization. In 1940, the population was around 20,000. Mainly native Inuit, but also Danes and some Norwegians. Greenland was a colony of Denmark, administered by a handful of Danish civil servants. In 1940, this great expanse of mountains, glaciers, and fjords was governed by a Dane named Eska Brunn. After the German invasion of the homeland, he assumed rightly so that Denmark would be under Hitler's control and would be forced to act according to Nazi wishes. He would continue to communicate with Copenhagen, but could not fully trust any directives coming from home. 
there is nothing left to do but make Greenland an independent nation for the duration of the war. Brunn was particularly worried about Greenland's east coast, 1,600 miles of desolate wilderness. The, the Germans might attempt to establish weather stations or military bases there, and Brunn would be helpless to stop them. He consulted the Americans who were still officially neutral, but they clearly did not want a German foothold in North America. The Americans advised that virtually all of eastern Greenland's scant population be evacuated to the south. That way intruders could be spotted readily. Brunn agreed, but suppose the Germans did come. Who would detect their presence? Brunn formed the Northeast Greenland Sledge Patrol, a handful of Inuit, Danes, and Norwegians who would keep the coast under strict surveillance. The sledge patrollers were about 15 men in all and had their headquarters in the isolated village of Eskomenes. Before the war, most of them had been solitary hunters or trappers and they were thoroughly familiar with the icy wilderness. As the name implies, patrols were by sledge and dog team. The range was from 70 to 77 degrees north, about 500 miles. Even before the sledge patrol was formed, the United States began to take active interest in Greenland. Dr. Henrik de Kaufmann, a Danish ambassador to the United States, met with President Franklin Roosevelt the day after the Germans invaded his country. Roosevelt welcomed Kaufmann and immediately invoked the Monroe Doctrine. Though still neutral, the United States would not tolerate any outside foreign presence in North America. As time went on, Greenland became a protectorate of the United States and for the duration of the war at least. But would the Germans make a move? The question was answered in the fall of 1940 when Norwegian supply ship Vela Skari which was carrying Danish and Norwegian hunters and 50 armed pro-German collaborationists were caught by the free Norwegian warship Fridjof Nansen. Their original mission was to seize the weather station at Mig... This is going to be hard to say. Migbukta and send meteorological reports to the Luftwaffe, which probably would have succeeded but for the Fridjof Nansen's timely intervention. In June and July 1941, the U.S. Greenland Patrol was organized under the direction of Admiral Harold Stark, Chief of Naval Operations. The Greenland Patrol was ordered to support the U.S. Army in the latter's offensive to construct air bases in Greenland. But above all was to defend Greenland and specifically prevent German operations in Northeast Greenland. The patrol was placed under Commander Edward Iceberg Smith, something of a legend in the U.S. Coast Guard and a veteran of Arctic climates. Smith commented that his mission was of a little bit of everything, but the Coast Guard was used to that. In September 1941, the Sledge Patrol reported that strangers were seen at the entrance of Franz Josef Fjord. Now in full alert, the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Northland discovered a Norwegian fishing trawler named Busco some 300 miles south of the earlier sightings. The crew was questioned, and they admitted, finally, to having landed a party with a radio transmitter. After a diligent search, the Northland dispatched a 12-man shore party under Lieutenant Leroy McCluskey to investigate suspicious hunter's shack. Rifles at the ready, the shore party surrounded the shack to make sure none inside could escape. Once his men were in place, McCluskey kicked open the door and rushed with gun drawn. Three startled Germans were inside, but they offered no resistance. The hut contained radio equipment, but the Germans seemed almost relieved they were captured. They offered McCluskey a cup of coffee and started a fire to heat it. The sharp-eyed lieutenant saw this was a ruse and attempted, it was just an attempt to burn their code book before the Americans could seize it. McCluskey rescued the code book just in time. The Busco was often cited as the first American naval capture of the Second Great War. Technically, the claim is inaccurate since the United States was neutral and Pearl Harbor was some three months in the future. In fact, the Germans and the Norwegian cohorts were taken into custody not as prisoners of war, but as illegal immigrants. How American. The Germans made their boldest and for a time most successful Greenland four-way in 1943. In August, the German trawler Sachen sailed with a weather team to Sabine Island on Hansa Bay near Greenland's coast. It's about 70 miles from the Sledge Patrol's base at Eskomenes. The expedition was led by Lieutenant Hermann Ritter, an Austrian who was not a Nazi and was said to have little enthusiasm for the mission. Ritter was also uncomfortable that the Sledge Patrol headquarters were so near, or at least by Greenland wilderness standards. The German weather party, codenamed Halzog, successfully established a station, then hunkered down for the winter. In the spring, Sledge Patroller Marius Jensen and two Inuit approached the Sabine Island. They were surprised to discover tracks in the snow. Men with heeled boots had passed there. These had to be strangers, and a short time later, Jensen and his companions spotted a hut that looked inhabited. 
Its occupants had fled, but could still be seen as tiny specks in the distance. When Jensen entered the abandoned hut, his eyes were drawn to a jacket. It had the swastika insignia. The Germans had landed. Jensen managed to get back to Eskimanes to spread the alarm. It occurred to Governor Brunn that the sledge patrollers were civilians, and they might get into a firefight with the Germans. If captured, they might be executed by the Nazis as partisans or bandits. To make them legal combatants, Brunn formally made the patrol the Greenland Army. Its leader, Ib Poulsen, became captain, and others received various ranks. Thus, these 15 or so men became the Second Great War's smallest official army. But the men had little time to savor their newly found status of being an army. The Germans launched a surprise raid on Eskimanes and burned it to the ground. The few patrollers who were there at the time managed to escape, but the destruction of the base was an Allied setback. On their way back to their Sabine Island base, the Germans encountered sledge patroller Eli Knudsen and machine gunned him to death. Ritter had wanted him alive. Later, two more sledge patrollers were captured. One of the prisoners, Marius Jensen, found Ritter alone and turned the tables on the German, capturing him and marching him 300 miles south to the Americans' custody. In the meantime, American bombers located Sabine Island Weather Station and bombed it. The trawler Sokken was destroyed in the same raid. The Sokken's crew and its weather team abandoned the wrecked weather station and hid until evacuated by a flying boat a month later. One team member, Rudolf Suntz, was left behind and was later taken prisoner by a shore patrol from Northland. By 1944, the war had turned against Germany and its resources were dwindling. But weather reporting was still so important, the Nazis continued to send furtive expeditions to the Arctic. In July, the Northland had located and destroyed a German weather station at Cape Susi. Later, Northland discovered the German trawler Coburg trapped in the ice and gutted by fire. Clutching at straws in a wild effort to stave off defeat, the Germans planned three additional weather stations in the Arctic. The first expedition was headed by a Lieutenant Weiss. It was romantically codenamed Idleweiss. The second under Lieutenant and PhD Carl Schmidt was labeled Goldschmidt. A third F.U. codenamed Hodigan was sent by submarine U-307 to Spitsbergen. Weather expedition Idleweiss was aboard the trawler Heidegen when it was caught by the ubiquitous cutter Northland. After a seven and a half hour chase, the German trawler was stuck in the ice and scuttled. Its officers and crews were taken into custody. The U.S. Coast Guard now had newer and more powerful weapons at its disposal, including a new class of ice-breaking cutter. The USS Eastwind was one of these, and it responded to a report of suspicious activity on Greenland's little Coldaway Island. A specially trained landing force, which was unique in Coast Guard history, was aboard and quickly went ashore to investigate. The Americans surprised and captured the 12-man Goldschmied weather party without a shot fired. The East Wind followed up this success by locating and capturing the ship that had originally landed the Goldschmied team. The German trawler Externstein surrendered after East Wind fired some warning shots. Externstein was the only German surface vessel captured at sea by U.S. forces in the Second World War. Weather Station Hodigan was a cluster of huts that was lavished by Arctic standards. The facilities included a seven-bunk dormitory and a library of 20 volumes. The German personnel there were a mixture of technicians and soldiers. They heard of the German surrender by radio on May 7, 1945. For the next few months, there was a strange interlude as the Germans continued to broadcast weather data, but in plain transmission without code. They finally surrendered to a Norwegian ship in September 1945. They were the last German unit to capitulate in the Second World War. The Meteorologists The weather war had a curious Canadian postscript four decades after the German surrender. It began on October 22, 1943 when the German submarine U-537 arrived at Martin Bay in northern Labrador. Meteorologist Dr. Kurt Sommermeyer and his assistant were aboard, and their principal mission was to set up an automated weather station. Every effort was made to keep the installation secret. There was a chance it might be discovered by Allied forces, so every effort was made to throw such visitors off the track. It was marked with the legend, Canadian Weather Service, and the ground was littered with American cigarette butts. Dr. Sommermeyer made sure the station was working properly, and then the Germans left for Europe. Unfortunately, Vetter Fungarat, WFL number 26, also called Weather Station Kurt, was only operational for a few short days. Kurt stopped transmitting, probably because of faulty batteries or some other problem. 
Weather station Kurt was forgotten until the 1980s. Summermeyer had passed away by this time, but his papers were intact, giving a researcher a clue as to the station's whereabouts. The station was relocated in 1981, complete with canisters, tripod, mast, and dry cell batteries. Weather Station Kurt is now on display at the Canadian War Museum, a tangible reminder of a fascinating episode in the history of the Second World War. Well, that's all I got for you today on the World War Weather Series. Stay tuned, I got more coming on this topic, but it might take me a while. These are videos, take, takes a lot of effort to make these videos, so please help me by hitting, hitting subscribe, hitting like, hitting share and uh, telling a friend, leave a comment, of course, and uh, help the algorithms for me. And uh, hey, join me on Patreon. I'd like to get that going more. I could use some finances to keep the things rolling here at the Outlaw Mountain Lodge. Anyways, that's all for me today. The dog says I gotta go. Bye.